Amen. Most of those words were taken straight out of the Psalms. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. And then he told his wife in that psalm, he said, I sought the Lord and He heard me. This man, poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his fears. Would you turn this morning to Matthew chapter 25? Jesus speaking. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Then Jesus admonishes, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of man cometh. Verse 10, would, I would probably take my title from that verse. It says, They that were ready went in. And I'd like to take that word ready and make a question out of it for the title this morning, the theme, Ready? <coughs> That's a question to be answered. Ready? Speaking of the coming of the Lord. The theme this morning is one must stay ready for Jesus' return even in, during those long stretches when it seems like He's never going to. I said one needs to be ready for Jesus' return even during those raw, long stretches of your life when it seems like He's never going to. Ready. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your people. Lord, give us a sense of eternity in this service. Just... Shut up all of our hearts, O Lord, to the truth. Shut out every distraction, Lord. Lord, may people feel the peace of the sanctuary. May they feel, Lord, that you're speaking to them from your word this morning. Talk to us as your church, your people. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's not ready, that before we leave this service, Lord, they'll find their soul prepared and ready to meet you, their Lord and Savior. Anoint me, Lord. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Yesterday, or the day before actually, Friday, one of my friends from across the country called me. And when he called me, it, it jogged my mind because a year ago, he was in service with us. And it was a year ago that we began this series on the parables of Jesus. This is the last one. It's not the last parable I had to pick and choose because there's, however you figure it, between 40 and 60 parables in, in the Scripture. So I haven't preached that many, but this is the last one we'll be preaching in this series. Today we conclude it. And so in concluding it today, I just wanted to briefly tell us where we've been. We've learned that parables were all about the kingdom of God. And through the parables we've been shown that the Christian life isn't self-serving, but the Christian life, too, is all about the kingdom of God, the convincing of His kingdom. Contrary to what's being taught and preached today, we've learned through the parables that being a Christian isn't just about being blessed, getting a special buzz from heaven, having lots of health and wealth, but we've learned that being a Christian is all about the kingdom of God on an advance where souls are saved and added to His kingdom. These parables have taught us what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom is 
wherever Christ rules by ruling over the heart of willing people. Wherever you've got folks that have surrendered to Jesus, you have the kingdom of God because in that heart in life, Jesus rules. And could I tell you, wherever Jesus rules, there is peace. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's the kingdom of God. We've also learned that the kingdom of God is always a paradoxical dichotomy. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, you read about the kingdom, it's already here, but it's also coming. You read about the kingdom, it's now, but it's in the future. You read about the kingdom, it's within the believer, and yet the believer is headed into it. You read of the kingdom, it's on earth, but it's in heaven. You read about the kingdom, it's you living believers, but the kingdom of God is also ever believer that died in Christ, hallelujah, who's in heaven today. Amen. The kingdom of God, we learn, is unseen in the hearts of men, and yet one day the kingdom of God is going to be visible to the whole earth, forever eyes shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail, but the king is coming to rule with the rod of iron, and there'll be peace and holiness and righteousness will cover the earth as the waters of the sea. Oh, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. But this parable tells of a time when that dichotomy I just mentioned will be no more. It'll be no more because what is coming will have arrived. It'll be no more because the new Jerusalem will descend and the old Jerusalem will arise. The dichotomy will be no more because we which are alive in Christ shall be gathered together and meet those who have died in Christ. Oh, hallelujah, the unseen kingdom will be become a visible kingdom. This parable is about when the dichotomy is no more. Why? Because it says this parable tells us that there will be the uniting of the kingdom when the bride is united with the groom. If you need a refresher, we the church are the bride and he is the groom. And one day the bride will be united with the groom. Help me just a little bit on the monitors. Hallelujah. Amen. What one day will be a cause of rejoicing for so many. Will be a cause of great distress and calamity for those who are not ready. Amen. You know in our entertainment world today there is a real fascination with apocalyptic movies and series. How many knows that right now? I mean there's a huge inundation of apocalyptic media movies. In fact I believe it's this week that the movie world is coming out. The TV world's coming out with a comedy apocalyptic series. A comedy apocalyptic series. When I heard that, I thought only Hollywood could think of making the end of the world a laughing matter. But it is no laughing matter. This inundation of apocalyptic movies and TV shows has desensitized people to the reality that the end is coming. In fact, to them, it's just a movie. I tell you, it's not a movie that the end is coming, that Jesus is coming. It's not a theme of the movie. It's part of the gospel. He is coming again. Ever I shall see him. Ever kindred of the earth shall be judged. It's not a a laughing matter. Amen. This world only thinks seriously about the end of the world when they give credence to the environmentalist frantic alarms over fantastic theories. But I'm telling you, the coming end is not a fantasy. The coming end will happen. Human history as we know it will end. This world as we know it will end. The apocalypse is coming. And the beginning of the end, there'll be great war and great famine and great disaster disease and great destruction but that beginning of the end will climax with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and at his coming there's going to be an upheaval, there's going to be a purifying, there's going to be a judgment there's going to be a renovation and the old things will pass away and the old things will become new, there will be a new heaven and a new earth and King Jesus will rule over all visibly, personally with us. 
And so again, in this parable, there's so many we've covered. We have the themes that Jesus is coming, but we have the themes that there could be a delay. And if there is a delay, we must remember whether he comes today, comes tomorrow, or next week, the message continues to be, get ready and stay ready. Hallelujah. How do you do? I want, I want you to ask, answer this question. How do you do when Jesus hasn't come and doesn't come when you expected him to? You see, every Christian, everyone that genuinely got saved, there was a period in their life when the expectation for his return was a living, vibrant reality. I mean, you genuinely expected Jesus to come at any moment. But then there's times in your life that the coming of Christ seems so distant. It seems almost like a fairy tale or a dusty legend. The question is, how do you and I do when the coming of Jesus Jesus seems like it's never going to take place. I want to get way ahead and tell us this morning, just because it seems like it's never going to take place does not mean that it's never going to take place because His Word is true and Jesus is coming. Oh, hallelujah. If you're ready, you ought to look forward to it with anticipation and eagerness. But we must get into this parable. What is going on? we got to go back a chapter. Matthew 24. And Jesus said, unto them, his disciples. See ye not all these things, these temples, this Jerusalem? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? The destruction of Jer Jerusalem. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus sitting upon the Mount of Olives has been asked these questions by his disciples. When are you going to come back, Lord? When's going to be the end of this world? They're asking the question of the Lord. You know, here's my thought. At least the disciples were concerned and interested in the coming of the Lord and the end of the world. They were concerned enough to ask the Lord when they were going to be. Amen. I, I think it's important to be concerned. There was a time when even unsaved people were concerned about the end end of the world and Jesus coming how many knows that the unsaved and now in the church the saved are rarely talking about the coming of the Lord there's very little interest in the church world today of the coming of the Lord when I got prayed through called to preach as an 11th grader in public high school I began to take my Bible to school that was hard for me to do I'm a shy person but immediately when people saw that Bible the students my fellow students there was an interest there I can think of times in the geometry classroom Room. I can think of times around my drafting desk when those kids, some of them were partiers, concert going, rock and roll concert goers. But I remember them gathered around my desk because of that Bible there. And they began to ask me what was coming, what was going to happen. They could tell something was about to happen. They began to ask about, the, about Christ coming and how he would come and when he would come. I'm telling you, the unsaved used to have an interest in the coming of the Lord. And now many times... Even the saved home, the disciples were asking about the signs of his coming, the signs of the end. But Jesus gives them a parable here to emphasize that more important than knowing the signs of his coming is to be prepared for his coming because you can know the signs of his coming and still not be ready. And so this parable emphasizes not just knowing the signs. He gave them to the disciples in Matthew 24. But in Matthew 25, he shares the story that it's not enough to know the signs of his coming, but we must be prepared. Hallelujah. What is the earthly story this morning? I read it to you, but let's look at it. Verse 1. 
The kingdom of heaven is like unto ten virgins took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. I want you to know, first of all, that these ten virgins, they were not spectators. They were participators. They were a part of the wedding party. We've been having weddings around here. But these ten virgins were a part of the wedding party. They were no doubt the bride's attendants, the bridesmaids, if you will. These weren't sitting by the roadside in the darkness waiting to, for the wedding to take place so they could see it. These were they that were at the bride's house helping and her make preparation for the coming groom. Amen. You see, this parable is not addressing the saved and the unsaved. It's addressing two kinds of people who both consider, both kinds consider themselves to be a part of the kingdom. Both kinds of these folks consider themselves to be ready for the end of the world. The five foolish thought they were ready. You've got to get this. The five foolish thought they were prepared. They thought they were ready. After all, they had lamps. Amen. And yet, even thinking they were ready with the lamp, they did not have enough oil. The point is, the foolish were not ready. But the wise were. Because they made preparation. Not just if the bridegroom would come at that moment. But they had made such preparation if the bridegroom put off his coming, they would still be prepared. They would still be ready. I learn already in this parable that thinking I am ready is not the same thing as making sure I am ready. The foolish, Sister Wilson, they thought they were ready. And so we learn that thinking you're ready is not the same thing as making sure you're ready. In the custom, the bride was waiting at her house with her attendants, these virgins, while the last minute preparations were made for the feast, the banquet, and while the last minute negotiations were going on between her dad and the groom's dad about the dowry and all of that. She was waiting for the negotiations to finalize. And when the feast was ready, when the negotiations were complete, then the bridegroom would leave his house with his attendants. He would go to the bride's house and greet her, meet her with her attendants, and then usher the bride and her attendants back to his house for the marriage, for the feast, and to live from there on out with his bride. But now let's look at these attendants, these ten virgins. They had lamps, but their lamps were not little personal flashlights so they could see their path in the darkness or feel more secure. No, these, these, these lamps were literally torches. I mean, they were torches that were to play a role in the marriage procession. These lamps were torches that these attendants would help light the way of the procession. And then when the attendants got to the feast, these torches were a part of the celebration dance and then when they sat down to the feast these torches were to light the banquet table oh hallelujah I'm telling you it's still about light glory to God to be truly ready is to have an experience with God that produces enough light in your life to impact those around you and your world I just gotta say it right now I'm only truly prepared for His coming when I've got enough light to make enough difference not just for me but for those around me. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Verse 2, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. We're going to be shown what made the difference between the wise and the foolish. I just want to tell you briefly the word fool here. I'll say it in Greek. You'll recognize it in English. Moron, moron. It meant someone that was dull, a blockhead. You ever met a blockhead? 
I've met blockheads in church. How do I know they're a blockhead? Because you can tell them the truth over and over and over. They think it's going to be different with them. They think they're an exception. They refuse to listen. They know it all. They've got everything taken care of. I mean, the Bible just says that's a blockhead. Now, you don't call them that. Let the Bible call them that, okay? Or let me do it for a minute here. Amen. They were foolish. They were dull. Amen. The word wise literally means thoughtful. I mean, they thought about this. The deciding factor between the foolish and the wise was that the wise had made preparation for the end, the coming of the Lord, the judgment. Did they think only of the moment that would be a fool? Or did they make preparation for the future that would be the wise? How many knows there is a wise way to live and a foolish way to live? If you're not living expecting Jesus to come, you are living foolishly. If you think you have all the time in the world, you are living foolishly. If the things of God mean nothing to you, you are living foolishly. If you don't care whether or not your children serve the Lord, that's foolish living. Oh, but if you're thinking about the future, if you're taking the Word of God for what it says, if you're preparing your house for the coming in, if you're taking measures to keep your heart pure, your mind pure, your life pure, your home pure. That's not a fool. That's a wise virgin. Can you say amen? And so the foolish were those that were living unprepared for the coming of the bridegroom. They lived as if things would continue on and on and that there would never be an end and they would have plenty whenever it came. But the wise lived in constant preparation. The wise lived never slacking even when the coming of the bridegroom seems as if it will never happen. Verse 3, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. I want to emphasize again that the foolish thought they were ready. In fact, if you had looked at the foolish virgins, you couldn't have told them from the wise ones because the foolish would have appeared that they were ready by all appearance the foolish were ready for the bridegroom I mean you could see their lamp in their hand you could even see a little flame there the trouble was you could not see whether or not there was any oil in their vessel that they brought you could see the outside did you know by appearances there are some folks who appear ready but you can't see inside their vessel and see if they have the oil that they need. The foolish had lamps and their lamps were burning. They had the instrument, but they did not have the needed fuel to last until he came. It made me thought of what Paul said as a sign of the end times. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. He said there would be folks that have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I'm telling if they're ever living in a time when there's folks, they got the lamp, they got the torch, they got the form, they got the structure, they got the program, they got the instrument, but they do not have the power, they do not have the oil to last until Jesus comes. Amen. The foolish only thought of the present moment and made no provision for the fact that the bridegroom might tarry. The foolish lived only for the moment and never for the future. You listen to Today, ever athlete that is, is is interviewed, almost ever person of, of importance that is interviewed, they'll say something about living for the moment. I know there's a little truth in that, but they've taken it as the whole package. Everybody's talking about living for the moment, living for the. Moment. I'm telling you, that's great in, in its limited saying, but I'm telling you, it's a fool that only lives for the moment. The wise, he is living for eternity. I said he's living with the prospect. Of of eternity. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamp. The wise live life always preparing for what's ahead. Now I'm going to tell you something. In this parable, if there had been no wait, if the bridegroom had immediately come, all would have had enough oil. If the bridegroom had immediately come, the foolish would have had 
been ready as the wise. You see, that's the whole point of the parable. The foolish only made plans for the immediate coming of the bridegroom. But the wise planned realizing the groom might delay his coming. I want to talk to us believers. Truly, Scripture teaches we must always live expecting Christ to come at any moment, this moment. But we also must be prepared if for a long time He doesn't come. Amen. One that makes it certainly believes that Jesus is going to come at any moment. But if you make it, you also realize we must have must have to wait or may have to wait for a while. But either way, whether He comes the next moment or we have to wait for a while the point is be ready verse 5 while the bridegroom tarry they all slumbered and slept you know people get really upset when they've heard and believed that Jesus is going to come at any moment and then a long period of time goes by and he still hasn't come folks have lost out with God over that or failed to believe that he's ever going to come Jesus tried to prepare people for that he tried to prepare them for that with this very parable he said the bridegroom tarried and he, the bridegroom tarried because there were preparations still being made. I want to tell you this morning, I don't know why Jesus didn't come in the year 45 AD. I don't know why he didn't come in 500 AD. I don't know all the reasons, what I'm trying to say. I don't know why he didn't come when I was a child. I don't know all the reasons. But I do know one reason he has tarried. I do know one. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long Long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He may not come in the next five minutes, but if he doesn't, I'm not gonna get discouraged and quit. I'm just gonna think that somewhere, somebody in the next five minutes is kneeling at an altar and getting saved. Hallelujah! Their life change. I don't know every reason he tarried. That's not the point. The point is, if he tarries, I'm still gonna be prepared. I'm still. He didn't come when you were a young Christian. He didn't come, Brother Wilson, when you were a young man. But I know your life. You're still living prepared. Hallelujah. And if you get to be 90 years old, you'll still be prepared. That ain't too long. You'll still be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. He could come today. But if he doesn't, I'm going to be ready tomorrow. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 6, at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. How many knows a cry is coming one day? He's coming. You go meet him. No one would have ever expected it when the day began that it would have been this late, this far into the night. How many Christians would have expected it? that Jesus would have put off His coming this far into the night. We're a long ways into the night. One day that cry is coming. As a young man, I, I made a lot of silly mistakes. I still do. I told someone this week, you can say 21 profound things. and People miss them. You make one grammatical error and they're on it like a shark. But I thought I'd get tricky. I mean, I really thought I had a message, but I thought I'd get tricky. I was going to preach on the 11th virgin. Five wise, five foolish. But who was that that gave the cry? The bridegroom cometh. I I was preaching we need to be like that 11th version. Not just have a light burning, but we ought to be like number 11 that will be shouting to this world, the bridegroom's coming. It would have been nice except for one thing. I kept preaching about the ten foolish and the ten wise. And I ended up with 21. (laughs) Ruined it. But I want you to know something. One day there is a cry coming. Notice there's two parts to this event. The bridegroom's coming. But those that are ready are going to meet him. It certainly appears that we're approaching midnight. I don't think things have ever seen blacker and darker. And very soon the cry must come. But if it doesn't come, amen, we're still going to be ready.
Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. i got to tell you one more thing about these lamps. These were not indoors lamps where you have the big reservoir and a, and, 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 and a wick. These were torches. They had rags tied on the end. If they even had a reservoir, it was very shallow. And being torches, they had to have constant attention. You had to constantly be re-soaking the wick of the torch in the oil or if it did have a small reservoir as some of them did you had to constantly be replenishing that reservoir these were not inside lamps that you could set the wick of flame and they'd burn through the night and they had to these torches had to receive constant attention some said about every 15 minutes or so they had to replenish oil I, I, I just want you to know as these torches required constant attention and supply I feel like we as Christians living in the world we live in we're just like these torches we require constant attention and supply hallelujah we can't afford to miss a service hallelujah we can't afford to miss a Bible read I think we need constant attention and supply how many just be honest and say this morning I need more oil in my lamp I need a replenishing I need my wick trimmed I need oil from heaven I want to be ready when Jesus comes the sad thing is the five foolish as we've said thought they were ready when they weren't and then they made another mistake they thought they could get ready by borrowing oil from the others but I'm telling you the lesson here is a person can never make it on the experience of others the five foolish thought they only had to get the oil from those that had it listen mama might have it daddy might have it even your children might have it but you cannot get to heaven on somebody else's experience you gotta get the oil for yourself and thank God though these foolish went out and found the shop closed and couldn't get the oil I want to tell you in a crude sense the shop is still open this morning if you're low on oil if you lack oil you can come in and get replenished this morning hallelujah oh hallelujah someone say glory to God amen verse 9 but the wise answered saying not so lest there not be enough for us and you but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves again prepare for yourself verse 10 and while they went to buy the bridegroom while they went to prepare the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut amen they that were ready don't you want to live in that company don't you want to be classified with that group they that are ready are you in that group this morning they that are ready they went in with him to the man and the door was shut just like on Noah's ark the door was shut I'm telling you today right now today I've lost count I've lost count of the time you can tell but I've lost count of the day what is it June 24th 2012 I want to tell you this morning the door of grace is wide open whosoever will can come this morning and call on the name of the Lord and be the door is wide open but I've got to preach to you there's coming a day when the door is shut and when the door is shut nobody else gets in today is the day to get prepared today's the day oh hallelujah I feel the Holy Spirit talking to us I know you feel this way but I want to live so I qualify for the group that can say I'm ready. Verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. The answer and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Lots of folks know of the Lord. They know about Him. They know the Gospel. They know about church. Yet they won't be ready. He says, I do not have a personal relationship with you. I know you not. I want you to know this morning, I can't tell. But our God knows everyone that's ready. And everyone that isn't. What was Jesus driving at? He tells us in verse 13. Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. When the Son of Man cometh. And notice. The message is... Don't just be prepared if He may come today. You've got to be prepared if He comes today. But be prepared because He may be a long time in coming. The point is, Jesus said, nobody knows when He's coming. 
It could be today. It could be next week. It could be next year. How many knows that the church has already waited 2,000 years for the return of the Lord? Did you know there's believers here that have waited over 60 years for the coming of the Lord? Now, I want to make two points. Number one, that does not mean he could not have come 40 years ago. He could have. It does not mean he couldn't have come 500 years ago. It just means that he didn't come, but he's still coming. Be prepared. Be prepared. Although his coming could be at any moment, his people must be prepared if he delays. We don't know the day or the hour. Thus, we must be prepared for the long run. I told someone Wednesday night trying to help them. In this servant God, you've got to realize, Jesus said, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Endureth. That doesn't sound, you don't endure pleasant things. You don't endure good times. We've got to be prepared. It'll take us through the bad times. A pre- preparation will take us through the trial, the difficult place. Even we have a job to do to shed this light. We must be continuing to be a torch with the light right up to the time that Jesus comes. Now I want to put that all together. Am I watching? The answer comes from another question. Is my light still shining? You can apply that to yourself this morning. Ask yourself the question, am I ready for the coming of the Lord? You can answer that question by answering this one. Is my light still shining? Hallelujah. Last of all, as we've been doing, this is our last time. What should we do from this parable? First of all, I want to talk to us as a church. I don't say this facetiously. I don't say this in comparison or arrogance, but too much, too many places, there is no message of the coming of the Lord in the church anymore. And as a church, we must never lose the message that Jesus is coming, even though it seems at times He never will. We must keep, whether it's Sunday school class, kids classes on Wednesday night, whether it's preaching from the pulpit, the songs we sing. I like praise and worship songs. We need them. But we also need to sing about the coming of the Lord. Because as a church, we cannot leave that message. I could preach here. I'm not going to. I'm going to go on. As a church, we must never lose the message that believers must constantly and continually be prepared. Amen. I I know I don't have time to make all the qualifications. We're only saved if we're covered by the blood of Jesus, plus and minus nothing. But I'm telling you, we've lost the message of getting ready and preparing. We've preached it so much that you can just say you believed in Jesus. That's an automatic ticket to heaven. I think there's preparation that needs to be made. That needs to be the message of our church. And then to the church, I'd like to say we must realize that it will become increasingly dark as that day approaches. Amen. I, I, I don't know how close we are to midnight. Amen. I, I'm not a calamity hour. I, I, I pray there will be a regression of events of this world. But I'm telling you night, darkness of night is approaching. And we as a church need to preach that it was in the darkness of midnight that the cry came. The bridegroom cometh. As a church we must realize that it's in the darkness that our lamps are needed most. You know, it's not just about being ready for Jesus to come. This message is about the lost of our world dying hopelessly. And when we're not ready, we're not shining. And when we're ready, our lights shine. And the world can see the good works of God and have a witness and be saved. I'd like to say to believers from this parables, we are called to be virgins and we are called to let our light shine. We're called to be virgins in the sense that we are called to live purely. We are to keep ourselves uncorrupted from this world. We're not to claim a relationship with Jesus and carry on a relationship with this world. He's coming after a virgin church. One that is pure, committed to Him. Amen. For some, it simply isn't that you've run out of oil. It's that you have never really caught it. That God wants you as an individual to let your light shine. I'd like to say to believers, we must realize that our light can go out if we do not give it attention. Did you know if Jesus came right after some backsliders today, right after they had gotten saved, they would have been ready. 
But he didn't come right after they got saved. They let the world set in. They let their hearts grow cold. And they're backslidden today. Amen. Don't let your light go out. Give a constant attention, believer. And then I like to say to believers, we need enough oil to get to the groom's house. Hallelujah. May that be your motive. May that be your goal. I want enough oil to make it all the way. How many is in this to make it all the way? I've got to have enough oil to make it to the groom's house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then, believers, we must often be awakened from our sleep and trim our lamps. I want to call attention. They all slumbered and slept. And there are times we all get dull spiritually. We must be shaken awake and let the Holy Spirit trim our lamps and fill us fresh with oil from heaven. I'd like to say one more thing, time one more thing to the believers we must live life making every decision considering eternity don't just make the decision for today make the decision for eternity and before I close I'd like to say from this parable to unbelievers you may not hear it when it comes but that does not stop the fact that one day that cry will go forth the bridegroom cometh and so I say to unbelievers you must get ready now today before the door is eternally shut I'd also like to say to unbelievers you can become like anyone else you can become one of these virgins with a lamp that's burning I don't care your past I don't care your life he's a God that can purify your mind and heart and whatever your life in sin he can make you a virgin this morning someone of purity that qualifies to be the very bride of Christ and he can put oil in your heart and ignite your life and cause you to be a burning flame hallelujah instead of 21 virgins we can have 21 million and more hallelujah maybe I didn't get it wrong maybe he's seeking to add virgins to that company that's ready when he comes oh hallelujah would you come music you've heard the message will you get prepared You've heard the message. Will you get prepared? How many remembers the tsunami in 2004 in Asia? Hundreds of thousands of people killed. There was one small group of people. They're called the Morgan Sea Gypsies. There's only 181 in this tribe. They spend most of the year on the sea between India and Indonesia and Thailand. They spend their time in boats fishing. But every December, that's the time the tsunami hit. Every December, they go to an island of Thailand, and there they build these shelters on, on the beach and wait for the time when the weather is such that the fish will be running again. And so on December 2004, the Morgan Sea Gypsies were there on that Thailand island beach. They were there in those rickety shelters. But they had been given a piece of advice that had been passed on by their elders for years and years. They had never seen this happen. They had never had to follow this advice. But passed on in that tribe, the Morgan Sea Gypsies, from their elders had been this advice. If you're ever on a beach and you see the sun, the sun, not the sun, the sea, you see the sea suddenly recede. You get the people off the beach to high ground because whatever amount now the, these weren't scientists these were just people who knew the sea whatever amount the sea recedes it's going to come back with even greater force On December 2004 Morgan Sea Gypsies were there in their houses someone yelled out come look the sea quickly receded there were fish flopping everywhere where the sea had just suddenly went out being fishermen, the instinct was go grab the baskets and containers, fill them up with the fish. That's money, that's food. But they had taken the message of the elders passed on through the generations.
And the chief, the 65-year-old chief of that tribe, cried out to the Morgan Sea Gypsies, everyone, quickly, don't wait, don't hesitate. Run for higher ground. And he pointed to a mountain. And 181 of them, everyone obeyed. And they ran and left the beach and climbed up the slope onto the mountain. And it wasn't long that tsunami came. You saw the pictures swept their shanties away, destroyed people's lives and habitat. All but every one of the 181 were saved. Why? They had never seen it. They had never seen it up to this point. But they had heard the message passed on by the elders to the general. And when it happened, they were prepared. They knew what to do. Oh, hallelujah. I know it's been a long time and Jesus hasn't come. But thank God we've had the message pass on through the generations of the elders. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing the sea receding. Everywhere I'm seeing things you thought you would never see. It tells me one thing. It's time to be ready. It's time to be. And why could not ever 181 of us be ready? Hallelujah. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Do you want do you want your lamp full of oil and burning brightly? If you want to be ready, we'll just stand all over the building. Lift your hands and your hearts and say, Lord, reignite me. Fill my heart fresh. Fill my heart anew. I want to be prepared. I want to be ready. I want to be watching. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, speak to someone's heart. There's nothing else to be said. If you're here this morning, whether it looks to people like you're ready or not, however it appears to people, you know. You've already asked the question, is my light still shining? That answered whether you're, if you're here, this is it. This is it. If you feel like this morning you're not ready, should Jesus come today? Will you feel you're not ready if he should come next week? If you feel you're not ready, I want to invite you right here, right now. The door is open. I want you to come about this step we use as an altar and say, Lord, make me a virgin. Make me one whose lamp is burning. Purify my mind, my, my heart, my life. Oh God, you're no respect to persons. You'll do it for me this one. Are you here? I want to ask you the question. I want you to answer it all. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you have to answer no, I would hesitate I'd come right now would you come go ahead and come you answer the question and you can't answer it affirmatively I'm ready would you come right now right now right now I can answer affirmatively I, affirmatively I am ready would you come amen here comes a young man are there others you just answer honestly I, I need oil I, I, I need something purified in my life are there others you'd come right now hallelujah I'm telling you the water's going back it's receding look at the signs of the time are there others like to join these young people you can't honestly say I'm ready this morning you say pastor that's old fashioned to give that kind of altar call yes and that's why folks aren't ready that's why folks aren't ready hallelujah it is about getting a good buzz at church and rejoicing for a little bit it's being ready for whenever he comes hallelujah who's going to join these young people this morning anyone in the house you can't answer the question I'm ready you'd like to come and pray oh this is a time to seek his face hallelujah are there others you'd like to come who's going to come and pray with these young people hallelujah are there others you'd like to come adults in the building moms and dads it's hard to get your house ready mom and dad when you're not ready just tell you the way it is it's hard to get your house ready when you're not ready would you come are there others come or come find someone to pray with hallelujah are there others would you come? I want to be ready. I want my vessel to be full. I want my light to be burning. I want to be filled with oil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's fill these altars. Pray for these that have come. Pray for these that have come. Hallelujah. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be watching. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, Lord. I will watch and be ready. I want to be ready. I will watch I wanna every be ready. day. I want to be ready. Oh, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. Fill my vessel. Trim my lamp. Lord calls me away. I'll be watching. Oh, let's cry out to him, church. Lord, we need you. 
Lord, we need you. I will watch every day. Lord, we need you. For I Lord, we need you. Ready, oh, when my Lord, Lord, we need you. Oh, let's call on him, church. There's a group of people getting ready to leave. There's a group of people getting ready to leave. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. I want to be ready. For I want to be ready when my Lord calls me away. Oh, hallelujah. This is between you and the Lord. He'll fill your reservoir this morning. Call on you. 